Mr. President, uh, Oxford Union, I am absolutely delighted to be here. My name is Ewan McGahey. I work at King's College London, uh, indeed in the home of the Oxford Union, uh, which, as Philip put, is also the home of many an honest uh, politician. Uh, somebody like Boris Johnson, I understand, used to be in your role, Matthew. I hope that you do not go in his direction, uh, but it is an absolute delight to be here in front of uh, you and, uh, and address you. Uh, on this incredibly important topic uh, of whether we should have faith in net zero uh, before 2035. Uh, and I want to put a very simple case to you, that we should not have faith in net zero by 2035 for two main reasons. Number one, we should have much more ambition than that. We should be on the side, and we are on the side on this side of the house, of being optimistic about our unbounded capacity to make sure that we have a living planet for everybody around the world and to improve our lives as a whole. We can have clean air, we can have safer jobs, we can have energy bills go down, we can have a better environment for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren, but we can't rely on this idea, this slogan of net zero because that contemplates the idea that there could be a useful role, a useful continued role for the fossil fuel industry, just so long as they do some offsets, just so long as there is uninvented technological solutions like carbon capture and storage or direct air capture. No, what we need is now zero. We need to get to 100% clean energy as fast as technology allows and not be fixated by distant dates like 2050 or 2035, which seem like they, like the politicians are doing something, but also function in another way, which is to be a license for fossil fuel corporations and the polluters to keep on profiting until that date uh, on the assumption that maybe they can do something to wriggle out of the political settlement that's been set. So no, no, thank you very much. Uh, so we need now zero, that's the first main point, as fast as technology allows. And we can't do it without root and branch political change. And I think that we have a lot in common. Uh, I certainly have some admiration, a great deal of admiration, in fact, uh, for people like Chris and Philip in the Conservative Party who are trying to push this agenda. But what I want to try and get across is that it's not just about individuals with good intentions, it's also about structures. It's about structures with profit-making corporations driven to profit whatever the social cost from destroying our planet. And it's also about political parties which can be funded and co-opted and corrupted by the same profit-making, anti-social, anti-environmental agenda. So those are my two main points, and I'm gonna flesh them out uh, with, or two main ideas if you like, and I'm gonna flesh them out with three main points. Uh, firstly, I'm gonna talk about uh, how we got to where we are in the rise of uh, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere, uh, but also try to persuade you that the technology is there and what works is really meaningful and often hard political and legal change. The second main point, that I'm gonna try and flesh out, is that we've got the technological tools at the moment, but what we don't have is either the implementation or enough of the legal rules. We've got the technological tools, but we need better legal rules, and that is something that is not happening under this government since 2010. And the third main point is I'm going to address the sort of uh, corporate uh, greed angle and the political corruption angle uh, and try to convince you that if we stay on this track uh, we are not going to get to net zero at all. Uh, we're not going to get there by 2035. What we should have faith in is also social change because this problem, the problem of climate damage, is really uh, at its root a social phenomenon. Okay, so it's absolutely true that every slick of oil, every puff of smoke, Every whiff of gas is doing us damage. But it's also true that these things uh, come from people, people working in corporations like BP, like Shell, like Exxon, like Drax. Uh, it's toxic corporations that cause the pollution. And, and those are the things that we have got to change. 
In the Industrial Revolution, if you've gone back uh, before the big expansion of coal industry in the United Kingdom to begin with, there was about 280 parts per million carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, today, there's 419 parts per million in the atmosphere. And if we get to 430, that means that we're going to be probably around 1.5 degrees. Uh, and that is going to happen, and I hate to break it to you, in the next three or four years. When you get to 450 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and leave aside methane and everything else, but if you just focus on CO2, if you get 450 million, you're at two degrees. And on the current trajectory that we're at, we are going to get there by 2032. So, you know, this motion that we need net zero by 2035 is not enough. Uh, we need drastic action, very quick, and we do it through political change. And I'm very glad, actually, that the previous speaker got up uh, and said that, uh, well, what we need to do is follow the economics textbooks and internalize the externality. Uh, well, actually, there's a good history on this, because when we look back at uh, the history of environmental regulation, what we see is that attempts to regulate don't really work, but bans really do. The most successful international environmental law is the Montreal Protocol, uh, which closed the hole on the ozone layer after it banned chlorofluorocarbons, which are in fridges and uh, aerosols uh, and so forth. Uh, so bans actually work, and there's good literature on this. My colleague, Fergus Green at UCL, uh, has written about anti-fossil fuel norms, and he makes the case very persuasively that when you have a ban, and think of the great bans in history, the ban on slavery, uh, the ban on aggressive war, uh, the ban on nuclear weapons testing, bans galvanize a political coalition in the way that language of regulation and internalizing the externality just don't. They create moral clarity. And that is precisely uh, what we need to do. So we've actually got a whole range of bans coming up. Uh, we've got the ban after 2030 in the UK on the internal combustion engine or for new uh, cars uh, to, uh, that, that are petrol or diesel fueled. Uh, we've got a ban on gas heating in new buildings from 2025, 20, uh, but we don't have anything yet on fossil fuel energy generation. And what we need to do is push those further and faster because, yes, we are actually losing money. We are losing money. Forget just the environment for the, for the moment. We are losing money by having dirty, inefficient vehicles, homes that aren't properly heated, uh, and also energy bills that are absolutely going through the roof. You know, if we didn't have our addiction to fossil fuels, we wouldn't be in this current inflation crisis that we now face. Energy bills, a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds more uh, for every home, leading into uh, or feeding out of or coming from also a crisis that was connected to the mismanagement of the economy uh, under Liz Truss. So people are paying huge extra mortgage bills, they're paying more energy bills. All of these things would disappear if we get rid, or when we get rid, of fossil fuels. But we need, no thank you very much, um, but we need legal rules to change. We've got the technology there, we've got electric vehicles, we've got heat pumps, wind and solar and battery storage are cheaper than coal and oil and gas, uh, and their costs are continuing to go down. We've got the technology there, but we need legal change. And I'm just gonna give you a few examples of the sort of legal change that I'm talking about. First, the things that we've got already, but we haven't implemented. Uh, the government in 2013 passed the Automated and Electric Vehicles Act of 2013, and this said that it could be required that every petrol station or car park could install, install uh, or be required to install electric charging points. What has happened? Very, very little. The powers are there, but they're not being used. In 2015, an incredible act of parliament was passed, the Infrastructure Act 2015, which amended the Petroleum Act that said the Oil and Gas Authority, the regulator for North Sea Oil, had a new mandate to maximize the economic recovery of petroleum. Drill as much oil as you can. Drill, baby, drill, is what this government has done on the, or in the shadows while they've been talking about net zero by 2050 or 2035 uh, or whenever. Um, we could have so many new duties as well. Uh, we need corporate duties. We need to have polluters pay, not to profit. Uh, does that mean I've got one minute left, or does that mean I have to finish? No, you can finish. A bit to finish, like one minute? Yeah, okay, okay, great. Um, uh, there's so much to go through. What we, need is, what we need is corporate duties as well. We need to have, I've been in the Court of Appeal today, as you might have heard, um, arguing that our biggest pension fund in the UK needs to divest fossil fuels and also have a policy to decarbonize all the companies in its portfolio. 
Uh, we need to have corporations with legal duties as well um, to uh, match the ambition that government uh, is having. We need a carbon border adjustment tax, like the EU is doing, which taxes imports uh, that are polluting into the United Kingdom. We've got to have polluters paying, not profiting. Now, Chris has written a big report called Mission Zero, uh, an independent review to get to net zero. It's got 129 recommendations there. Many of them are good, but a lot of it is relying on things like carbon capture and storage, which envisages this idea of the continuation of a fossil fuel industry. And I've got to point out that the Conservative Party has taken enormous amounts of money from fossil fuel interests. 2021, there was 1.5 million in fossil fuel donations. 2022, there was 3.5 million. Liz Truss, of course, our last Prime Minister, I don't know if you still remember her, she worked for Shell. Uh, before she got into power. And Chris, you wrote a book with Liz uh, called Britannia Unchained a few years ago, uh, where you argued, you know, you got this big list of 129 recommendations, but in the book you said, once they enter the workplace, the British are among the worst idlers in the world. And I don't know how you can have the ambition for net zero by 2035 with all this work to do uh, when you are part of a party. When you're part of a party, I'm sorry, when you're part of a party that does this... You, I, I, I'm terribly sorry, but you're a co-author of the book, and you've got to take responsibility. He's got to take responsibility for the party that he's in and the fossil fuel interests which fund them, and that's why this House should have no faith in net zero under the current political structure. We need an overhaul of the corporate greed. We need an overhaul of the political interests which are backed by the polluters, and that's... Uh, uh, why I commend to the House the motion, please vote in favour of the proposition. Thank you very much.